Can you hear me? Yes, Dehan, we can hear you. Hello. Hello, Dehan. Okay, uh, I think people are joining still, but uh, let's start anyhow. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all can hear me uh, and have a stable connection to participate with us today. Uh, we are about to begin the second guest lecture of the lecture series organized by the Physical Society every year. It is less than ideal that we have to hold this lecture series online but uh, we make do because we believe it is important for our students. Um, apart from the obvious advantages that I spoke of even last time during the first lecture, like uh, gaining extra knowledge and meeting physics graduates from different fields, there are some underlying importance to this lecture series as I believe. To point out a few benefits, uh, like if a student doesn't know about a certain field, like the guest lecture might help them and like get to know that field and he might he or she might fall in love with that field and choose that as their life's work so i think that's really huge and also it helps the students to get first hand knowledge from someone who is actively present in the field and also clarify their problems and in, ask all questions that they have regarding the lecture or sub with the any question and clarify questions uh, regarding that subject matter and that relevant field during the Q&A session that is offered after the guest lecture uh, during this program. So I think this lecture series is really important for our students and, uh, and I think it is a great opportunity. So uh, participants are still joining and I received a few messages saying there are some connected issues but I Hope they can uh, join up soon because we have to stick to the agenda. So uh, without further ado, I call upon my colleague Hisuri Hitinaika to deliver the welcome speech. Hisuri. Um, thank you, Dihan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today and deliver this welcome speech at the second guest lecture of the annual guest lecture series organized by the Physical Society of University of Pera Deniel. First of all, we'd like to welcome Dr. Varuni Sinvi Ratna, the head, Department of Physics, and dear lecturers. Next, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. P. W. S. K. Bandaranaika, Senior Treasurer of the Physical Society for his kind guidance and support. Physical Society would like to thank Dr. H.C.S. Pereira for, give, for giving this opportunity, opportunity of the guest speaker for today. We, as the members of Physical Society, would also like to welcome all the students who are participating at this event. At this moment, I also would like to invite all the students to join with us during this virtual talk series. Next. I would like to extend a very special welcome to our guest speaker for today, Dr. Juna Satyan. Dr. Juna Satyan is a senior lecturer in the Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Electrical Engineering at the Northumbria University in Newcastle, UK. She has titled her speech for today as From Blazers to Mazers. I'm sure you will enjoy today's talk and explore some new knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Suri. Uh, well, I'm sure our students would get would like to get to know our guest lecturer a bit before she starts the lecture. 
So I kindly call upon Dr. H.C.S. Pereira, who we heard is a good friend of our guest lecturer, to give a small introduction about her. Madam. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, madam, we can hear. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'd like to warmly welcome my friend, uh, Juna Satyan, Dr. Juna Satyan, for our uh, guest lecture series, the second lecture of our guest lecture series. So uh, Dr. Juna Satyan, as uh, uh, Ms. Suri Hitinaika mentioned, that she is currently working as a senior lecturer in the Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Electrical Engineering um, in Northumbria University, UK. And uh, she basically uh, works in the uh, applied optics field and uh, she's uh, developing uh, new technologies, uh, uh, new technologies uh, in that area. So her current research directions are focused on laser technology, uh, room temperature, laser technology and brightness enhanced solid state light sources and optical spectroscopy. So we met, I mean, I met Dr. Satyan when I joined uh, Queensland University of Technology Australia when I started my PhD in 2012. And she was into her final year in her PhD. And she is a very dedicated scientist and she's a very humble person. That's what I like the most about her. And uh, so we developed a friendship of a lifetime. And uh, Dr. Satyan received her PhD in nonlinear optics and laser physics from QUT in 2013. And uh, her thesis uh, contributed uh, to a lot in solving one of the serious issues uh, in electro -op uh, optic modulator devices. Because of her prominent work during her PhD, she received a postdoctoral research uh, associateship in 2014 and she joined Imperial College London in UK and uh, there she uh, worked as a key researcher and co-developer of world's first room temperature continuous wave maser. This was published in Nature uh, at, as well as it was patented. And uh, meanwhile, she was uh, working on a high brightness, solid state light source design, and it was built and written one of the most influential paper on these devices. Um, so this technology will uh, bridge the gap between high cost, high expensive, very elaborate laser devices and low cost, low brightness light sources. So she is currently uh, an associate fellow of higher education academy, and she is uh, honorary senior lecturer at Imperial College London, and she is a collaborator in the Mesa Group at the Northumbria University. So I would like to thank you, Dr. Sakian, for accepting our invitation and agreeing uh, to conduct the lecture today. And besides that, I'd like to uh, invite any of the students, if you like this area, you can uh, contact Dr. Sathian. She's very helpful. So um, yeah, you can think about that too. So I welcome uh, Dr. Sathian for our lecture today. Thank you. So I hope you can see my screen, isn't it? Yes, we can see it, madam. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, H.C.S. Pereira. She's my dear friend. And we did actually, um, you know, a research together. So we do have a collaborative uh, journal paper together. And I hope we can do more exciting research in future. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and for the kind words. 
thank you Physical Society for inviting me to speak today in this annual guest lecture series. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and good to see you all today. So let's go into my presentation. So this talk is basically designed to give you an overview of my research in lasers and masers. Okay, so this uh, research I started at uh, Imperial College London, uh, and then I'm continuing with the collaboration uh, again with Imperial at Northumbria University UK. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will give you an overview of my education and career, and then my PhD, just briefly into my PhD work. And then I will move on to my postdoctoral research and my current research, which is basically an extension of my postdoctoral research work at Imperial College London. Okay, so I did my bachelor's and master's in India in physics. And after that, I moved to Australia uh, to do a PhD in physics at Queensland University of Technology, uh, specifically in laser physics. And then I moved to UK, uh, to Imperial College London to do a postdoctoral research in laser and maser, and also high brightness light sources. And currently I'm at Northumber University, UK at Newcastle, uh, as a senior lecturer, uh, where I continue my research, uh, which I started uh, at Imperial College. So let's, uh, a single slide uh, regarding my PhD. So in my PhD, so basically I'm an experimental physicist. So I am an optical physicist and, spe uh, and specification, you know, and specializes in laser physics. So in my PhD, I, the research was the noise analysis in laser modulators. So these laser modulators are devices that can control the intensity, polarization, and phase of the lasers. So I use these laser modulators uh, in order to study the noise and reduce the noise so that it can uh, do better from performance in a lot of application. And one of the application I looked into was LIGO instrumentation. So LIGO is a laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. So it's a large physical experiment um, which involves a laser and you know it's basically an interferometer setup. So this LIGO which is, uh, is there to detect the gravitational waves, okay? So gravitational waves are basically invisible ripples in space. So these are produced uh, due to say the collision of black holes, uh, you know, things like that. So this interferometer is developed to detect these tiny ripples in space. And then, you know, by knowing this, by studying these ripples, we can learn more new things about the universe. So that was actually the uh, main aim of this LIGO interferometer. And the laser modulators I studied was one of the optical component in this interferometer. So basically this interferometer setup, uh, the, the two arms, you can see a laser here and two mirrors. So it's basically an interferometric setup. So the two arms are quite, uh, you know, four kilometers, around four kilometers in length. So you can see actually uh, a similar setup. So this is one of the uh, LIGO observatory in Hanford, USA. And you can see the length of uh, each arm is around four kilometers. So it's quite a big, uh, you know, experimental setup. So one of the uh, the first gravitational wave was detected in 2015. So basically that gravitational wave was uh, produced uh, due to the collision between uh, two black holes. This happened actually 1.3 billion uh, years ago, but the waves, the gravitational waves actually, uh, you know, 
didn't make it to earth until 2015. So it took that much time and 2015 it got detected. And in 2017, this invention has been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. So, so this is the area I was, uh, you know, studying or my research in my PhD. In my postdoctoral research, I moved into uh, different areas. Um, you know, again, it's actually the key is my laser experience in my laser research, uh, you know, the optical uh, physics. So I, I researched basically three main areas. So first was room temperature diamond maser. Okay, so these are masers. So these are microwave devices. This produce microwaves where a laser produce light waves. So this is a patented work, one of my patented work, and it's published in Nature, and we developed the world's first room temperature continuous maser. The second work was developing a uh, laser. It was an infrared laser. So it's basically used in applications like LIDAR uh, in you know, laser cooling and trapping uh, in basically in quantum technology application. And the third research area I was uh, into was the high brightness light sources. This is again a patented work. Uh, so basically producing high brightness and efficient light sources to use in application like laser pumping, maser pumping, and also in medical application like endoscopy. So these are the three research areas I started when uh, I was uh, doing my postdoctoral research at Imperial College London. So I was uh, there for around five years, you know, developing these specific areas before I moved to Northumbria University as a, you know, lecturer. So if I, if I talk more about the electromagnetic, uh, you know, the spectrum and the area I work in. So basically I work in the visible region. So I build light sources in basically, in, you know, the, the quite a bit length of the visible region and also in the near infrared where I build lasers and in microwave uh, where I build masers. So these are the specific areas I work in the, if you consider the electromagnetic spectrum. So first I will talk about lasers, you know, how I developed or how I build lasers. And then I will move briefly into the high brightness light sources. And last but not the least, I will talk uh, quite, uh, you know, widely about the maser research. So diode pumped alexandrite lasers. So these are the lasers I used to build uh, for LIDAR and also for quantum technology applications. So the aim here is to build high efficiency and high quality lasers that have very narrow line width to use in light trapping or laser trapping and cooling application. That's the basic application we aimed at. So this work was uh, a collaboration between uh, different industrial partners and also the funding was from Innovate UK and Engineering and Physical Science Research Council UK. And the end result was the development of world's first unidirectional continuous wave Alexandrite ring laser. So I will explain actually how uh, we uh, get into that end point. So laser, we all know it's an acronym. So laser is an acronym and it's light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So the principle of laser is the stimulated emission of radiation proposed by Albert Einstein in 1917. So laser device, if I can explain simply a laser device, so how I build a laser. So basically a laser device consists of a single optical cavity. You can start with a single optical cavity where you have a gain medium. It can be a crystal, a solid state crystal or a gaseous medium or a liquid medium. Okay, it can be anything. And it will be enclosed between two mirrors. So this is the simple, simple resonator setup. So this will be enclosed between two mirrors, okay? The one mirror will be totally reflecting and the other mirror will be partially reflecting. 
So basically, it's a fabric broad cavity consisting of two uh, opposing mirrors. Okay, it can be flat mirrors, it can be curved mirrors, depending upon the you know output we want. So the the phenomena, as I said, is the uh, stimulated emission of radiation. So what happens actually? So when you have this uh, setup of this laser medium, you input the um, or you excite the gain medium here the crystal using another optical pump or electrical uh, pump source okay and you create a uh, state called population inversion which i explain later and then once you have the population inversion all the other incoming photon and also because of the property of your gain medium, you will have a chain reaction, okay, of stimulated emission and eventually you will get uh, the, you know, the high energetic laser beam at the output of your partially reflecting mirror, okay? So around 99% reflecting mirror. So you will extract the laser beam at the output of this partially reflecting uh, mirror. So this is the simplest setup. But the laser I built, uh, the alexandrite laser, because the crystal or gain medium is the is alexandrite crystal. So that is a complex cavity. It's, it's a, in a shape of a ring. So what I did, I built actually a complex cavity or a ring cavity around this, you know, single tumor cavity, okay? So, if you want to know about uh, the population inversion, the condition for laser, I have a few slides coming up. So as I said, if you take actually a gain medium, okay, if you are uh, considering a crystal uh, to pump it and to, you know, to get this laser radiation. So you can start thinking about a two level atomic system. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, atomic system you can start, you know, to explain the population inversion and stimulated emission. So you can start actually a two level system. And what you need at the uh, beginning is the population inversion where you have more atoms in the upper excited state compared to the ground state. So once you have this population inversion, which you attain using an optical medium, any other incoming photons that excite the uh, gain medium will stimulate the, ex, you know, the electrons in the excited state and make them to drop to the lower state or the ground state, which leads to the emission of an additional photon. So now you have two photons. And then these two photons can excite another uh, photon pair in the excited state, which drop down and this will give you four photons. And the, this is sort of a chain reaction uh, and you will again have another drop down due to these four incoming photons and now you have eight photons. So this will keep on going and at the end, you will get a stream of energetic uh, electron uh, photons at the output of your partially reflecting uh, mirror. So that's the uh, stimulated emission and the uh, laser radiation, uh, how, you know, how you extract the ra laser radiation. So basically this is the principle behind uh, the laser. So the diode pumped alexandrite laser, which I built in my lab, it's a complex laser system. So the, this is not a two mirror cavity. So this is a, um, you know, a ring cavity. You can see it's sort of an X shape. Okay, so this is a ring cavity that I designed around this two mirror uh, cavity. Okay, so it's a very complex system. We need this complex system because we need actually high precision output and a single uh, and you know single longitudinal mode and very narrow line with laser source. Okay, so that's the reason uh, to develop this type of complex cavities. So the demonstration of the diode pumped Alexandrite laser, um, there was. At another reason, because the aim is to replace one of the 
frequently used and expensive laser system uh, nowadays, which is the Tysafer laser, which is very expensive because of the expensive pump it's used, the green pump, the second harmonic pump source it used. So it's very expensive, around 100K. So the aim of this project was to replace this Tysafer system with a similar uh, system, but at low cost. Okay, so it should demonstrate the high performance of the ties affair, but at a low cost. So that's how we developed Alexandrite laser system. So this laser system is cheap because the pump source is cheap. So for the Alexandrite, we can use a red diode pump to excite the crystal and to get the laser you know, emission. So what we developed so by using this pump source, we developed this low cost laser system, which can replace the highly expensive ties of air. And to develop into a commercial platform in collaboration with a company to use in uh, emerging quantum technology application like laser cooling and trapping. So it's specifically uh, you know, related to the laser cooling and trapping application because in laser cooling and trapping, we are controlling uh, the atomic species. So in order to control the atomic species, we need to have narrow line width laser beams, you know, now narrower than the, you know, the line width of this atomic species. So this laser system enable to have that source of performance. So if I talk more about these uh, Alexandrite lasers, so we use Alexandrite crystal. So one of the important property of the Alexandrite crystal is that it's broad, it emits uh, in a broad wavelength region. So you can tune it from 700 to 850 nanometer near infrared. And also it has actually good thermomechanical properties so that you know if we need actually more output, you can actually pump it with more light. So it can withstand actually that much, the crystal can withstand that much power and also you know it can withstand the red diode laser pumping uh, you know at very much higher power so alexandrite crystal so this is a four level system so i talked about when i talked about stimulated emission population inversion uh, i talked about a two level laser system so two level laser system is the simplest way to explain things but Practical lasers are three level or four level uh, laser system. So this Alexandrite laser is a four level laser system. And this is the absorption band of the Alexandrite crystal because I used to do spectroscopy. So I used to study the absorption uh, and emission of these uh, crystals separately using uh, UVV spectroscopy. So this is the absorption spectrum. So you can see actually it can be pumped using a flash lamp because it's broader and also red diode pumping, which is very cheap. The commercial red diodes are very cheap at 638 nanometer. So this is how I developed uh, using the cheap um, red diode pump, you know, very less exp uh, expensive red diode pump. So this is the complex laser system. So it's sort of a ring cavity. And it also enables us to pump the crystal with very high power red diode laser to have a high power Alexandrite ring laser system. And we, you know, we developed it into a commercial platform uh, for uh, atomic trapping and cooling and also other applications like high resolution spectroscopy, quantum optics and laser LIDAR application, okay? So at the end of this project, we could able to develop the world's first unidirectional diode pump Alexandrite ring laser, okay? So this is a complex laser system over one watt of power and with high beam quality and smooth wavelength tuning. So you can tune it from around 700 to around 800 nanometer. And also you can see actually the line width. It's very, very narrow line width, okay? So we developed two variants. So one is sort of an X-shaped ring cavity and other is a rectangular shape ring cavity. So we have two variants uh, to develop uh, into a commercial platform, which is in uh, process. Uh, 
uh, we are also doing actually some sort of, uh, you know, miniaturization of this system by uh, changing the design, so which is ongoing work in collaboration with Imperial College. So that's all about my laser work, you know, building the laser, uh, designing the laser system, uh, all about uh, lasers. I also research on uh, LED pump luminous and concentrators. So these are high brightness light sources. So this can be used in lighting application. Uh, this can be used to pump uh, the uh, lasers and masers to produce low cost lasers and masers, okay? So these light sources, you can see it's a, it's, it's look yellow, but it is broad high brightness light sources, brighter than the LEDs. That's one of the key thing. So it's brighter than the LEDs. So it can be used in application where LEDs are used, but we need more brightness. Uh, basically, uh, the system is sort of a luminescent crystal pumped on either side using uh, different LEDs and you extract light at the output of uh, the crystal, end of the crystal, okay? I'm not going into much detail uh, about this system because I want to talk about masers. So again, uh, these high brightness light sources uh, can, be, can be used in endoscopy and pumping laser and maser. And it's been funded by European uh, Horizon 2020 grant, which is currently running uh, in collaboration with Imperial. So the last uh, research uh, I want to discuss with you is the room temperature diamond maser. So this is a collaboration between different universities, Imperial, uh, UCL, University College of London and London Center of Nanotechnology and University of Warwick and also um, the industrial partner, it's element six uh, to develop the world's first room temperature continuous maser. So this is the team at Imperial. So we do have a, uh, you know, scientists from different areas. You can see from material science, physics, measurement science, and chemistry. So we come together, we discussed, and we developed this device, uh, which can be used in a lot of application from uh, medical, from space application, from quantum computing uh, to measurement science. So we talked about lasers. So everybody knows lasers. It's used from, uh, uh, you know, CD players to laser machining to laser eye surgeries. Lasers are absolutely used everywhere. But what you might not know before the lasers, there were masers. So the masers were invented before the lasers. So lasers amplify light and masers amplify microwaves. So MASER is again an acronym which stands for microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay, so it produces microwaves. LASER is also an acronym, so I discussed it before. So it's light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The first MASER was invented in 1953, which was an ammonia MASER. So you can see the picture. So it was built by Towns, Gordon and Ziegler in 1953. And it took around 50 plus years. It took uh, around that much time to invent the room temperature maser, okay? The first room temperature maser. And that was in 2012 by the maser team at Imperial College. So the application of masers are varied. So it can be used in atomic clocks, ultra low noise microwave amplifiers and deep space communication. As I discussed, the laser is also called optical maser because laser was invented after maser in 1960. The first maser is the ruby laser built by Theodore Mayman in 1960. So the principle of maser and laser, it's the same. It's the same stimulated emission of radiation proposed by Albert Einstein in 1917. So as I discussed, it's the same like the laser. So a maser device consists of a cavity, a masing material and a pump source like a laser device. So this is a maser device. So like a laser device, it also contains a gain medium. It contains a cavity, which is not 
two mirrors, but this cavity is a cylindrical microwave cavity made of a dielectric material. And also the output is extracted using a copper antenna and not at the output of a uh, mirror. So it's different in that sort of uh, design, but the principle is same. It's the stimulated emission of uh, radiation. So the maser was invented before the laser, but there was some hindrance actually in moving forward with the development of maser. One of the important, uh, you know, hindrance was the cryogenics. The maser needed very, very low temperature to work with, so 80 Kelvin. So it required actually a big refrigerator. So the maser itself was very bulky, expensive, and difficult to work with. And when Mayman actually first uh, invented the room temperature maser in 1959, after nine months, he discovered or he invented the laser, the ruby laser. And also at the same time, a lot of semiconductor amplifiers that can actually you know, give the same sort of performance as maser um, in the case of frequency got invented. And this all hindered the application or further development of maser. So cryogenic was essentially the killer for the maser it halted the further development of Maser. But things changed in 2012 after 50 plus years. Um, it was invented the world's first room temperature Maser by the Maser team at Imperial. So it was using a different crystal, again, medium called pendacine. So you can see the pink, uh, which is the pendacine uh, crystal. So it was, it's, it's in a sapphire dielectric. So this is basically the resonator, okay, for the maser. This is the gain medium, which is the pendacine. And this is published in Nature. Uh, and uh, the invention is in 2012. So again, the wonderful thing about this material, the pendacine, is that it doesn't need refrigeration and it doesn't need a magnetic field so that you can mass produce it. So this is the pendacine maser, how it looked like. So the pendacine is a pulsed maser at 1.45 gigahertz. 1.45 gigahertz is the frequency of the existing traditional hydrogen maser, which is used in, uh, you know, space communication. So this is a setup of the pendacine maser. You, so you can see it's just like a laser. So you will have a pump laser, which pump the crystal, which is the pink, and everything is enclosed in a resonator here, a cylindrical sapphire, and, and everything is enclosed again in a copper cavity. So this is the sapphire resonator and inside that you can see the pendacine crystal. So if I just uh, briefly touch upon the, um, the optical pumping scheme, uh, this is the energy level diagram of the pendacine crystal, which make this laser you know, into a reality. So you have the pump light, so that's another laser I just showed in my previous slide. So you have the 585 nanometer yellow dye laser pump the pendacine. So the pendacine got is a three level system. So you have a singlet ground state, a singlet excited state and a triplet intermediate state. So you it's a three level system, okay? So when you pump it with the uh, yellow uh, light, the the electrons are excited into the upper energy state, which is a singlet state. And then it, it undergoes an intersystem crossing into triplet state. And the maser radiation essentially happens between the upper and lower uh, energy level of this triplet state. And you will get the maser emission, okay? So this all happens at zero magnetic field and at room temperature. That's the peculiarity. So again, what's the big deal with the new maser? So the traditional maser need a magnetic field and cryogenic temperature. So they are bulky, 
costly and just too difficult to manage. So there is no prospect for mass production, but in the case of Pendacin Mesa, it doesn't need cooling and doesn't need a magnetic field. So it can be miniaturized and mass produced. But still there's a problem because for practical application, it's really uh, good to have continuous maser. So the pendacin is a pulsed maser. So in our search for continuous maser, we ended up in a different gain medium called diamond. These are not natural diamond. These are synthetic diamond called CVD diamond, you know, using CVD growth techniques. And these are diamond having defect centers called nitrogen vacancy color centers. And this particular defect centers, which is a, again a three level system, when pumped will give you the maser radiation at uh, respective frequency, depending upon the small magnetic field you apply. So, the diamond maser, we demonstrated that in 2018, the continuous diamond maser and is published in Nature. So this is the setup uh, of the diamond maser. So you have a, again, a sapphire resonator inside which you have the gain medium, which is the diamond crystal with this defect senders, nitrogen vacancy defect senders, and you will apply a magnetic field. Okay, but everything works in room temperature and nine, you know, and it emits 9.2 gigahertz of uh, microwave radiation, but you can actually get different output frequency. What you need, you just need to change the magnetic field. So you can tune the magnetic field and you can actually get whatever frequency you need depending on your application. So this is how the setup look like. And there is also a YouTube video where I explain uh, with, along with my colleague, Jonathan Brees, you know, all the setup of the diamond maser. So you can actually go into this uh, YouTube channel. So basically in the case of a diamond maser, so you have the diamond uh, material, which is the gain media. And the peculiarity of this nitrogen vacancy defect senders is that it has three spin state. You can see minus one, zero and plus one, three spin state. And when you apply the magnetic field and green pump laser, you create a population inversion between the zero and minus one, okay? Two different spin state. You create the population inversion, just like the laser, you know, when you build a laser, and then you extract the microwaves uh, between the zero and minus one state. So here you extract microwave because of the peculiarity of this gain medium. So this is the energy level diagram. So you can find more information about this in the nature paper. So this is the diamond maser oscillation. So you can see it's very narrow, like a very narrow, you know, laser beam. So it's actually, you know, very narrow and stable at 9.2 gigahertz. So the application of this maser, so we are familiar with the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. It has Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G. It's what we call the microwave communication. We are very good at getting information from A to B and even in very challenging circumstances. And it doesn't get much more challenging than in space, okay? You know, getting information from A to B is very challenging if we, you know, consider the space communication. But with microwave communication, you, with the use of these microwaves, we can get information from the surface of Mars all the way to Earth, and that is 225 million kilometers away. So one of the application basically is the deep space communication. So this is one of the main traditional application of a maser. So you can see if you send information, so around 10 watt of information from a spacecraft, say in the outer solar system, so you need to have a uh, low noise amplifier at the earth station because what you receive at this uh, earth station is 
very feeble signal. By the time this 10 watt reaches the earth station, it will be very, very feeble, like 10 raised to minus 18 watt with full of noise. So what you need at the earth station is a very low noise amplifier that can extract only that feeble signal and amplify it without amplifying the noise. And that's basically the maser can do. If you see this picture, you can see there's a problem with this picture. This is the case when we don't have actually a good amplifier at the earth station to uh, collect the information. You will get a grainier picture of say a Mars rover. So the reason of this is the electromagnetic noise. Okay, so we need to avoid this noise. We are familiar with this noise. We have drop calls, we have interference in the lines, etc. But we need to solve this problem. There is a very close relation between the economic growth of a nation and its infrastructure with respect to the microwave communication. So this is a problem that we need to get into and this is a signal to noise problem. So if you look at this picture here, the signal we want is that blue line uh, on the left. Okay, this blue line. But you can see actually it's embedded in a lot of noise represented by the yellow lines. So it took more like uh, a blue signal in the right. So this is what we need by amplifying only the blue signal. So we need a very good amplifier to get this high signal to noise ratio or the blue signal in the right hand side. So amplifying signals is what a maser can do without adding the noise. But why don't we use masers everywhere? Because it's very bulky, as I explained. It requires cryogenic fluids to keep it going. It requires a huge magnetic field. So far, too difficult and incredibly expensive to operate. So that's why we don't use them practically in a lot of application. But now with this room temperature pulsed pendacine maser and continuous diamond maser, we can make a maser that can be practically used in a lot of different application. And all the above, we have a clear line of miniaturization. And you can see the progress. So we start with a five centimeter system and we are now at this one centimeter system with the diamond maser and the pendacine maser. So it's incredibly very, very small. And one day we anticipate that we will be able to put this device into a circuit board. And if we can do that, we have the way we thought of getting images from say Mars, which are fantastic and to send things which are difficult. So instead of a selfie of Mars rover, what we can see is the individual grains of sands on Mars, small, simple, and cheap. The three things that made laser so widespread now offer the prospect for a room temperature maser. So if we can pack all these wonderful functionalities of a maser into a one small circuit board in one device, we can sense a number of things. We can sense chemistry, we can do biochemistry, we can do medical information, and we can do diagnosis of disease using a single device. And also the Star Trek tricorder will be soon with us. And that's the end of my talk. So we hope like lasers in future, maces will be used everywhere. We discussed about diode pumped alexandrite laser, which is used in quantum technology application. We discussed about the pulsed pendacine and continuous diamond maser which is used in uh, space communication and we anticipate it can be used in quantum computer, computing or quantum information technology. And also I briefly touch upon the LED pump luminescent light sources, uh, which are the future of lighting application and also which can be used to develop low cost lasers and masers. So this is summary.
And before I um, end my presentation, I just want to uh, talk about the career in optics and photonics. I used to do this in every presentation. So optics is a branch of physics that basically studies the behavior and properties of light. And it got more, a lot of exciting jobs to be honest. So, you know, you can actually go into an optical physicist, optical fabrication technician, a laser engineer, a machine vision engineer, or a laser scientist, the job I am doing. So a lot of opportunities if you do optics or photonics, you know, depending upon which area you specialize. I would like to thank all my collaborators uh, in UK and also in overseas uh, to, you know, help me to work together and um, bringing the research to, um, to in, to analyze end products. Okay, so thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions uh, regarding my research. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. I know everyone will agree that the lecture was very informative and it was presented in a way so that all of us could understand. Thank you so much, madam. Well, uh, the next event on our agenda is a small question and answer session. Here our students can ask any and all questions that they have regarding the lecture or any relevant subject matter. And also if you have any questions and you can't ask them out loud due to any connectivity issues, just drop a message in the chat box. And I'm sure madam will be happy to help you all. Uh, and I encourage our students to take use of the opportunity. And uh, at first, our lecturers might have a few questions, and after that, our students can follow. Thank you. Thank you, Juna. It was very, very wonderful and uh, very informative. Um, one of my course, uh, PH313 uh, in optics, we have a laser section. So I encourage all of my students to participate here and I hope that they all get a very good idea about laser and MESA. And uh, I just have a very one, uh, very simple question, Juna. Mm -hmm. um, you are using a pump source, a laser, uh, around a yellowish laser around 585 nanometers. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what was the pump source uh, in the first Mesa. I'm just, just curious because they didn't have laser those days. So. Yeah, so in the, in the first laser, so there were like, you know, ammonia laser, so gaseous laser, we have the hydrogen maser, so things like that. So they used actually, you know, the electrical excitation, so because it was the gaseous, um, you know, um, medium. So basically it was the electrical uh, pump source, you know, due to the electrical excitation uh, rather than optical source. Uh, yeah, so in regarding the optical excitation with this maser, we also aim to use actually move into electrical excitation because that will again actually make the device more compact. Mm -hmm. So maybe our next step is going to an electrical excitation for the maser and also any laser because this will make the device more compact. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Jim. No worries. Hello, Dr. Santien. Can yes. You? Yeah. Yes. And you said about this uh, diamond, uh, nitrogen doped diamond crystals. Yes. Yeah. And also, it's an artificial thing. It's not easy to make. But how do you control the concentration or defect situation size? Because it's a very difficult process. And so, if you want to replace or to uh, characterize these things, mm -hmm. and how do you manage to get the same type of diamond with similar concentration uh, to reproduce? Uh, it's actually, there is some uncertainty in getting the similar type of diamond. So we do have our um, collaborator, they are uh, called Element 6. So it's actually the research wing of De Beers, the diamond company. So they have their um, you know, research wing where they actually make these diamonds, the CBD diamonds and HPHD diamonds. Uh, so 
when I started actually the Mesa research, uh, what I received actually is a collection of different um, CVD diamonds of different concentration. Uh, so, so we characterized and we know actually how much is the nitrogen vacancy senders in those diamonds. Okay, so, and then what we did actually, we, uh, we obtained the Maser out of these different set of uh, samples. So we have actually uh, these uh, different, different samples and corresponding Maser output. So we do have this standardization or characterization of uh, the number of nitrogen vacancies and uh, the output of the Maser. So we standardized that. Uh, and now we know actually uh, how much a nitrogen vacancy center can give you this much maser radiation. But as you said, actually, it's very difficult to recreate it, uh, you know, into a very uh, low uncertainty ratio. But the DBAs are, you know, very cooperative. Uh, so uh, they are actually trying hard actually to improve their annealing and uh, the CVD diamond, uh, you know, facility. Uh, so the research is actually ongoing. Uh, so I agree that uh, there is still, uh, you know, uncertainty in uh, from one sample to another, even we try hard. So that research is ongoing. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and it depends on the, you know, the, uh, the suppliers of our uh, diamond material uh, to make it actually more precise so that we can reproduce the uh, samples. And also we do have actually like a, a research wing, uh, which is a European research wing, uh, which is based in Port Portugal. So they, they do have research facilities where they can do actually much better uh, producing uh, sort of uh, similar samples. Uh, so that research is basically ongoing, but we are getting there regarding, you know, to, um, to lessen that gap when we recreate, you know, another, the next material, similar material. Okay, thank you. No worries. Uh, thanks, Apian, for a wonderful presentation. It was really uh, impressive to see the work, uh, the amount of work that you have done on this field. Uh, but you said this is good for the uh, high resolution spectroscopy. Now, how uh, small the, 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 the pulse width is in, can you go for a femtosecond? Uh, resolution of spectroscopy or something? Uh, so it's not the maser actually, you know, I prefer for high resolution spectroscopy. So you are talking about maser or the laser? The laser. Okay, so the laser. Yeah, so uh, the, the so we are developing actually uh, a huge laser system, that, you know, that can actually do the femtosecond spectroscopy using our, uh, high brightness light sources, which I mentioned uh, yeah. in collaboration with uh, CNRS France. So we are developing that system that can go into uh, that area. Uh, so the work is still ongoing. Okay. So we, we, we have a system. All right, thank you, yeah. Uh, if our lecturers have are done with the questions, I think the students can ask questions uh, if they have any right now. So I am I'm have I'm getting actually direct messages. So I have a couple of questions here. Okay, madam. So one of the question is: uh, Is there any health problems when we work with lasers than lasers? You know, so. When you work with uh, lasers and masers, it's similar because uh, for masers, we use lasers to pump the masers. So all the health and safety and uh, you know any other issues, uh, it's similar to uh, uh, lasers. But the frequency we are working with the maser, if you are talking about the microwave frequency, um, it's actually you know quite safe. Uh, 
so in, with regard to the maser uh, oscillation, I, I don't think uh, it's actually an issue, but we do have this health and safety precaution because of the uh, pump laser we are using for masers. Uh, another question is uh, continuous in continuous diamond maser, is there any specific uh, reason to use synthetic diamonds than the natural diamonds? Yes, there is a specific reason to use that because uh, in synthetic diamond we are using, we purposefully engineered defects into those diamonds in the form of nitrogen vacancy centers. So if you if you think about this a diamond, you know, it's basically the, you know, the chain of carbon atoms. So what, how we incorporate these color centers is we replace two carbon atom with uh, this nitrogen uh, vacancy. So we replace two carbon atoms. The one carbon atom is replaced directly by nitrogen and the next uh, uh, adjacent space uh, to that nitrogen is a vacancy. So that's how we got this nitrogen vacancy color centers. And these nitrogen vacancy color centers, are, is, they are three level system. And they are they consist of a, um, you know, ground triplet state, an upper excited triplet state, an intermediate singlet state. And when you excite this nitrogen vacancy centers, it has the property, all the property to do maser emission. So only CVD diamond with nitrogen vacancy color centers will work for maser at present. We are also exploring different materials uh, to work for, but this is the main material that currently working for maser. So I think that's clear. Uh, I can see another question. What's the application of quantum mechanics that help in your research? So basically uh, the quantum mechanical application I refer uh, is quantum information technology. So the MESER can be candidate for quantum computing application. And also uh, the applications like uh, laser trapping and cooling in the case of uh, lasers, the application of Alexandrite lasers. So these are the main application when I refer to quantum mechanical application. I think that's clear and I have more questions. So another question is uh, why the first mason need cryogenic temperature to operate? So if you talk about the Ruby maser, okay, basically we need cryogenic temperature because of this uh, atomic vibration only at this cryogenic temperature, we can actually reduce this vibration. At room temperature, it will increase uh, proportional to T raised to seven, which is T is the temperature. So that means actually, when you move from this cryogenic to room temperature, in the case of a Ruby Maser, the atomic vibration, the noise is much higher. And that will actually, you know, basically, um, you know, decrease all the performance of your output, uh, the maser output. So that's the reason actually, it's basically because of the gain medium or the material you used uh, for the maser. So that's why we used a different gain medium. That's a diamond with nitrogen vacancy center or pendacine for the maser, where we can actually work in room temperature, okay? Where at room temperature, there is, you know, less atomic vibration due to spin lattice relaxation or spin orbit coupling. Um, what is a laser cooling and how are lasers used to control the atoms to absolute zero? So the laser cooling and trapping is basically uh, using a narrow line with laser beam to control uh, the atomic species. And the, the main uh, requirement is that the line width of the laser actually you are exciting with the atomic species should be comparatively less than the line width of the atomic species you want to control, okay? So you are basically controlling uh, the 
the atomic species, thereby decreasing actually, uh, you know, the the temperature uh, to to absolute zero. So you can use actually this in atomic clocks, uh, you know, again, uh, high resolution spectroscopy, uh, etc. So another question, are lasers or masers more safe for medical treatment? So lasers and masers, uh, so this is used actually in different application uh, for medical treatment. So, you know, for lasers, it has actually like its own uh, health and safety. Uh, you need to take health and safety precaution, but because these are used in uh, different application, um, it doesn't apply, you know, we need to, again, actually, because MACER use a laser to operate, uh, we always need to take all the precaution uh, while using a, a laser or a MACER. Uh, the next one is, can we use MACER in cancer treatments? Because the MACER we developed is new, the the immediate application uh, we are looking at space application, space communication, and also MRI scanning, where if you use actually our MACER, you can actually have a scan uh, much more quicker than the current setup. Uh, so these are the application we are currently looking into. Uh, so we don't know actually where it can be used in a cancer treatment because the area is new and we are also exploring uh, the this new idea. Yeah, so so I think. Uh, hello, madam. Can yep. you? Hear me? Yeah, yep. I have a question on a diode pump Alexandrite laser. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, there are different. Uh, uh, models, I mean, uh, uh, keeping uh, those system in different shapes, X shape and in a circular shape. Is there mm -hmm. any uh, difference uh, we get uh, when we use different shapes uh, like that? Any efficiency or... Yeah, so, so we, we have actually two systems currently, so an X shape and a rectangular shape. So we started with an X-shape because the aim of that research was to replace the tie sapphire laser, the much expensive tie sapphire laser that's used in atomic cooling and trapping. So we really wanted, when we replace actually one system, we really want to have actually the same setup. You know, what we want is we just want to keep all the optics and we just want to replace the pump and the uh, gain medium. So that's what I started with the same x uh, cavity, which was similar to this tie sapphire system. And then I went on to uh, design another cavity, which was the rectangular cavity. And I found that the rectangular cavity is much more efficient than the X-shaped cavity. So now actually we are discussing with the company to miniaturize that model uh, because it's much more efficient. But in the case of output power, it's slightly lower than the X-shaped cavity, but the efficiency, I mean the efficiency, you know, in the, um, uh, the line width and also the beam quality, it's much more higher than the uh, X-shaped cavity. So when we design actually this different system, we don't know actually, you know, where we end up in, but regarding the Alexandrite laser, the, the rectangular cavity, give you much more uh, high quality beam and narrow line width um, and you know all other um, you know the better performance compared to the x-shaped uh, cavity so we are discussing actually this with the company to have a uh, another commercial um, or you know prototype device it's also much more thinner than the uh, previous uh, cavity so so yes there are differences in the performances when you go from one cavity to another 
And also it's much steeper compared to the X-shaped cavity because it used flat mirrors compared to the curved mirrors that use in the X-shaped cavity. So there are different. So that's why we have this research. Uh, so one, one of my PhD students, she's currently actually exploring another design to make this Alexandrite laser much more simple and much more cheaper and efficient. So, you know, another cavity, she's designing another cavity, uh, you know, for better performance. Yeah, thank you, madam. Uh, and also I have another question that uh, you can use microwaves for um, exchanging information, right? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned in the presentation. So uh, nowadays, uh, like uh, for an example, if you take uh, uh, drone operations, uh, mm -hmm. we are, um, sending signals and gaining signals. Mm -hmm. So one of uh, a problem in that controlling a drone is uh, getting interference due to uh, many reasons. So mm -hmm. if you use uh, a mesa like you um, explained in the uh, presentation in the future, you can embed into the circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen with the interferences and all Oh, it will be very, very low. It depends on actually like, you know, uh, which uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which region of the microwave, re you know, uh, spectrum uh, you want to explore. So with the diamond maser actually, so you can actually, you can get different uh, output frequency region depending upon how you tune the magnetic field around that diamond gain medium. So once you find the application of that specific uh, maser, it will be much more, uh, you know, less noisy. There won't be, um, there will be less interference. Everything will be uh, much more, uh, you know, very, very small uh, in the case of this noise and indifference because the maser is a system that only amplifies uh, the signal without amplifying any uh, background noise. So in all these cases, maser will be much, much efficient. Dr. Satyan, one more yeah. question. Yeah. You said that this uh, frequency is about 9.8 gigahertz, no? Mm -hmm. Mesas. Yeah. So then if you just think about wavelength, it is going to be centimeter, about 30 centimeters. No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the wavelength is larger and how you reflect these things with a very small thing, that's because that length is less than one wavelength. And, mm -hmm. and also because if wavelength is 30 centimeters, that reflectors and all these things, how it works for very small reflectors. So it depends actually on, you know, so depends on your application. So as I said, actually, so we produced a 9.2 gigahertz maser system. So we can tune actually the wavelength. Okay, so we can tune the uh, magnetic field around the, um, the maser medium to get whatever frequency you want, you know, depending on your application. So if your application uh, require actually much lesser uh, frequency or you know lesser or greater wavelength, you can actually tune the wavelength and you can actually get whatever um, you know whatever frequency you want for your uh, application. So we don't know actually how much we can go with that. We are still, uh, you know, at the early stages of uh, MESER. Uh, so we do have a magnetic field, which is uh, tunable, but we haven't actually explored how much uh, we can go in regarding the output uh, frequency so that you can to, uh, you know, explore the application regarding those output wavelength. So, we are basically at the early stages uh, of this uh, development and you know exploration. Uh, so, yeah. So the research is uh, still going on. I can say. Yes, but the thing is uh, that since wavelength is about thirty centimeters, mm -hmm. that uh, can we use very small uh, mirrors to reflect that large wavelength or signal with that wavelength? If uh, this mirror size is one centimeter, 
So, uh, you know, in the, in the case of this uh, microwave media, uh, we are not using mirrors. Uh, you mean the resonate in the case of an optical resonator. So we are actually using dielectric material to confine this cavity. So we are we are not using any mirror for this uh, microwave uh, in you know like a laser medium. Uh, so it's basically the we are confining uh, the uh, the microwaves uh, within a dielectric cavity. So that's the peculiarity of the dielectric cavity how it can confine. So the dielectric cavities we are using are sapphire and strontium titanate. So that can actually uh, confine uh, the dielectric properties yeah, that can confine actually this uh, microwave radiation uh, within that small region. Okay, thank you. Madam, I think there's one last question uh, in the chat box asking how information can be embedded into a MESA in deep space communication, if it's the same method as in radio waves. Oh, yes, yes, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same as the, you know, as the traditional uh, microwave uh, communication. Uh, it's the same uh, method uh, as I explained, actually, you know, in one of my slides. Yeah, so uh, I think that's it. Uh, anybody have any last many questions? That's it, the questions in the chat box as well. So there is one. Okay. Uh, okay, so there is one question. Um, can you please give us uh, physics undergraduates some motivation to carry on in this field of physics? Yeah, so basically I think, uh, uh, you know, how you actually can um, start a career in this area, basically. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, actually, uh, I started, uh, you know, I did a, a physics degree uh, and then I did a master's degree, but I did uh, the master's project in laser. Um, uh, in you know specializing in uh, laser physics and because of that uh, project or uh, because of that dissertation I am able to you know I was able to acquire uh, that uh, you know Queensland University of Technology uh, scholarship to do a PhD uh, and then uh, I did the PhD in laser physics and and then I, because of that experience in laser physics, uh, I obtained this postdoctoral research in MACER because uh, MACER basically use a laser uh, to pump the, you know, the gain medium. So I think, uh, you know, if you want to actually um, go into a, a direction uh, like a laser physicist or laser scientist, it's good to start uh, doing your undergraduate project, uh, you know, in optics uh, or, you know, any specialization in photonics or uh, laser physics. And then, you know, if you want to do actually uh, a master's project, uh, it's good to, you know, continue doing in that area. And also, you know, doing uh, some placement, if there is an opportunity for placement, uh, short placement in companies uh, where they, to optics or laser or photonics. So that's the way I did. And I ended up, uh, you know, doing um, yeah, research in lasers and being a laser uh, physicist. So, you know, doing small project um, uh, placement opportunities, you know, uh, occur some placement opportunities, uh, you know, good for your CV. And then uh, doing project in uh, specializing in photonics or a laser, uh, you know, that will actually help you to attain uh, a scholarship or, you know, in that case, if you apply for a scholarship for your PhD, you can actually write a good proposal uh, from your experience and then, you know, with a good CV, with a, you know, placement opportunities or things like that. But if you need more information, you can contact me, uh, you know, just email me, you know, I can actually uh, give more information about that. 
so i'm happy to help you out in you know in that case yeah I think that's it with the questions. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, madam, for your invaluable insight and for answering all our questions. Uh, well, according to what they say about all good things, our lecture has also reached its end. So uh, to thank everyone who helped make this event a success, I would like to call upon my colleague, Sajana Pera, to deliver the vote of thanks. Sajana. Thank you, Dihan. Uh, it's a great honor to me to express a word of thanks in such an event like this. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our guest, uh, Dr. Juna Sathian, Senior Lecturer of University of Northumbria at Newcastle, UK, for taking out time from her busy schedule and sharing her vast knowledge with us, with us about places and mesas. Uh, truly, it was a very lively lecture about an interesting subject. Thank you very much, madam, for your thought provoking and interesting ad address. Uh, next, I would like to thank our patron, head of the physics department, Dr. Varmi Seneviratna, and to the senior treasurer of physics department, uh, physical society senior lecturer, Dr. PWSK Banda Naika, for the guidance they gave in organizing this event. I especially thank uh, Dr. H.C.S. Pereira, Senior Lecturer of our Physics Department, for the support you gave in contacting our guest lecturer. I also thank all the lecturers of our Physics Department for the guidance they gave. Um, next, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, members of Physical Society of University of Peradeniya, for their fullest cooperation in organizing to make this event a grand success. I thank all the demonstrators for their presence and cooperation in this event. Um, finally, I would like to thank all the colleagues who have uh, turned up for this online event in such great numbers, uh, not only from our department, rather also from other departments and uh, faculties. Thank you all for your presence and I hope you have gained uh, meaningful knowledge from this event. Thank you. Thank you, Sajana. Well, uh, we have reached the end of our event. And also please know that the recording of this lecture will be uploaded in the YouTube channel of uh, Physical Society of Peradenia. So if you gain something, please pass on the message so others can benefit as well. Uh, and uh, that would be it. So let's wrap it up here. Wish you all a good day. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Madam. Thank you. Thank you.